Good morning. Yesterday we talked about a call for revival, a call to pray for a spiritual awakening in our country, a call, a call to fast for a renewal in our country, uh, a call to go, return to God. And so as we think about that call that has uh, been initiated for May the 5th, uh, we don't have to start. I mean, wait until May the 5th. We, we can start today is what I was trying to say. And we don't need to stop after May the 5th. We need to continue on praying with a burden for our country, for ourselves, our churches, our families to be spiritually awakened and return to God. A call to repentance, to change and revival. And that's what I want to talk today uh, with you today. Look to Luke chapter 13 in your Bibles. Luke chapter 13. We're going to look at several different passages once we get started but we begin with Luke chapter 13. And once again, we're going to continue our thoughts about revival requires change. Uh, we can't uh, be revived without change. We can't be saved without change. We can't do anything because when we approach a holy, righteous, uh, just God in our sinful state, in our flesh, uh, we have to change it. He requires us to change. Uh, we humble ourselves in fear of him, not afraid, but fear, reverence of him, seeking the change, realizing who we are and who he is. And so as we think on these things, and as we look into scripture, I want us to think about the call to change. Uh, Luke chapter 13, as we begin there today before we read scripture let's pray heavenly father i pray through the power of the holy spirit that you would open our eyes as we read that you would bless us with understanding and knowledge as we read and that you would give us wisdom from above that we would be convicted that we would be challenged that we would be equipped to live the life you call us to May our hearts truly be revived. And Father, by that I mean may our hearts truly be changed because we meet with you. Bless us now with your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, a call to change. Jesus himself said, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, unless you change your ways, unless you change your life, you will all likewise perish. Jesus laid it on the line. There's no gray areas here. He said, if you're living a sinful, unholy life, you need to change. And if you don't change, then you're going to perish. So he calls men to change. Uh, he calls us to be revived. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This verse we shared yesterday, it's a very common verse. Uh, you ought to be able to find it fairly quickly. But 2 Chronicles is an Old Testament, chapter 7 and verse 14. It's easy to remember because 2 times 7 is 14 and half of 14 is 7. I'm sure you all know that, but I need help. And that's one thing that helps me. 2 times 7 is 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God says, he's talking about repentance here. Uh, and he comes to this point, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Not only is there a call to change, but there is a response to change. You see, when this call goes forth, there is a response to change. We either accept that and respond uh, positively and change our lives or we don't accept God's call and we don't respond right and we don't change our lives but essentially we do change because we've heard the truth and we have decided to disbelieve and disobey it so there's a call to change and then we have to respond to that change one way or the other now I want to share with you to me the most classic uh, person in the Bible or story in the Bible or lesson in the Bible of, of a, a repentant heart and a changed life. Uh, 
a lot of people have different ones, but in 2 Kings chapter 21, we meet the son of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a good king in Judah. And in 2 Kings 21 verse 9, we see the need for change. You see, if there's a call and, and a response, there must be a need for it or the call wouldn't go out. And the need in verse 9 of 2 Kings chapter 21, uh, Hezekiah's son became king, became king after him. And it says, but they did not listen. And Manasseh, the king, led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. The nation of Israel at this time under King Manasseh did more evil than the evil nations that God did away with. They surpassed their enemies in their evilness. Verse 16, look down to verse 16. It says, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other with blood. Besides the sin that he made Judah to sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh turns out, if you read everything he did, to be the most evil king that Judah had. He was the son of a good king who loved the Lord. And in, he, he didn't change. He didn't repent. He lived in his evilness all the days of his life. And so we see a totally depraved king and one who's going to bring the wrath of God down on his nation, on his life. Now, we see that in Manasseh. Flip over to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. This also has story, you know, the story and the life of Manasseh here. 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 10, we read these words. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. God called to him out of his love and mercy. He called them to repent, and they didn't listen. It says, Therefore the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. They put hooks in his body, like fish hooks. They chained him up, and they took him away into captivity. This evil king God brought punishment and correction upon. And it says, And when he was in distress, this is Manasseh, in prison, all chained up, he, he becomes in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord. This evil king was brought to the end of himself, and he turned and called upon the Lord, his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him and God was moved. His humbleness, his fear of God, even late in life after all his evil, when he humbled himself before God and feared him and called upon the name of the Lord and prayed, this evil king, the worst one they'd had, it says he prayed to God and God was moved by his entreaty, by his prayers, and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. He restored Manasseh. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Sometimes, I even had a friend one time years ago when I was a teenager, a new Christian, said, Hugh, you don't know what I've done. I've done so much evil and, and I've been so bad. There's no way God would forgive me. Right here, it shows a person just like that. And when he humbled himself before God and forsook his evil ways in prison even, God heard his prayers and restored him. God can do it. All we have to do is believe what Jesus did on the cross and believe what God says about it and repent of our sins and, and give our lives to Jesus uh, to forgive our sins, to be Lord of our lives, and to come into his presence humbly. He says he'll save us, he'll forgive us of our sins because our sin debt has been paid on the cross. There's nothing so terrible that God won't forgive. Oh, but forgive me. There is. There's one. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 12. 
You see, we can live an evil life and repent humbly and be saved. Scripture shows us that. Manasseh shows us that. In Matthew chapter 12, we see the inability to change. There are some people who just can't change, who can't repent, who can't believe. In Matthew 12, 32, it says, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. We can blaspheme God and we can blaspheme Jesus and God will forgive it if we humble ourselves and repent. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. You say, why? Because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. He paid our sin debt, yes. But the Holy Spirit, when we humble ourselves before him and we repent of our sins, he is the agent of salvation. He is the seal of salvation. He is the earnest money, the down payment on our salvation. And he comes to indwell us, to sanctify us, to make us Christ-like, to change us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And if we deny him and deny his work, how can we be saved? If we deny him and deny his work, how can we be made Christ-like and changed in the image of Jesus? So if we deny the Holy Spirit and we speak blasphemy against him, how can we be saved? We've disbelieved and disobeyed the agent of our salvation. So there are some, because of their unbelief and because of their hard heart and because of what they say against the Holy Spirit and their disbelief, they, they can't change. They can't repent and they can't believe. But for most of us who are seeking God, we can. Most of us who are just living life, we can be pricked in our souls and change. And we need to. Turn over to Acts chapter 2. This is the last passage. The provision of change. The provision of change. Acts chapter 2 verse 21. It reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit bringing us to the point where we cry out to Jesus to save us. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This was eyewitness. This isn't some fairy tale. This Jesus delivered up according to the finite plan and foreknowledge of God. Our sins hung Jesus on the cross, but God sent him there. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. The giver of life, the author of life, life himself cannot be held by death. He laid his life down, but Jesus said, I lay it down because I know I'll take it back up again. He knew the end before it came. And he willingly gave him his life and shed his blood that there might be forgiveness of sins, my sins, your sins. And without it, there's no hope. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ to believe what he did and what God says about it. That if we repent of our sins and we believe in Jesus and call upon his name, we will be saved. The Holy Spirit will come and save our souls and in be implanted in our lives to change us forever. You see, we can't be saved without change. If we got baptized and joined a church and everything was normal and just went on, no. Salvation brings change. Repentance brings change. The work of the Holy Spirit brings change. Our lives. You see, because we cannot continue to sin because the Holy Spirit is grieved with our sin and we grieve also within our soul when we sin and we are pushed away from it. We're repulsed at it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is. Why? Because the Holy God is. 
That's why God admonishes us to be holy for he is holy. And that's through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you can evidence the change that's happened in your life. If you can't, I pray that you will humble yourself and seek his face and call unto the Lord that you might be saved for his honor and glory and for your benefit, your eternal benefit. Come to the Lord. If you're saved and you know the Holy Spirit's working in your life, if you've seen the change, you see, there was a time I doubted my salvation. And what got me through that period of doubt was God's faithfulness, yes. The Holy Spirit's work, yes. But also, I could notice I knew of changes in my life from the time before I got saved till the time afterwards. Allow the Holy Spirit to change your life through his power and work, through the word of God, and be blessed today. Take care.